Okay, so my project is about uh, recovering the structure of the RPF graphs. So the motivation came for the project by looking at the uh, current data sets in LOD, which is, a, which is a place where we can go and publish our RPF data sets. So most of the data sets in LOD does not have a very rich schema, which makes it hard for data consumers to find relevant information for query authoring. That means if a user want to write a Sparkle query to get the relevant data, they might it feel quite um, difficult because they don't have a proper schema. And this is a one, one factor. And the second factor is when there are, so now since we have so many vocabularies, people tend to use multiple vocabularies to design their data. Especially this is the very common case when we are converting from a relational database to the RBF database. So we get uh, the relational database and we use existing vocabularies to annotate the columns in the relational table and we got uh, some existing vocabularies to map the relationships between two columns and we just dump it as RDF datasets but without giving uh, uh, information about the schema. So because now there are so many vocabularies and people are using multiple vocabularies to de design the datasets, uh, it is also again a case where people find it quite hard to understand the structure even though we have a properly designed uh, data set, let's assume that we have uh, a data set with a proper schema, in that case also we are constrained by the uh, capabilities provided by the RDF uh, schema and R. For an example, let's say we have a property and we have two uh, concepts and we, what we can say is, okay, this is a concept A and then this is the relationship and this is the concept B. So how we are going to represent it to using RDF schema or our list, we get the property and we would say, Okay, the domain of the property is um, this concept A and the range would be concept B. But it does not say anything that whether uh, for each instance comes <coughs> under concept B must have this property or not. So this kind of information will be really important when it comes to query processing. For an example, when we, uh, there are large, uh, there are data set with large number of people, in which case we cannot handle it in a one, one phase. So what we try to do is we distribute the data sets by getting relevant subgraphs subgraphs and then try to query by using those uh, different subgraphs, subgraphs located in different locations. So in that case, uh, case also we need to have a solid understanding about the structure of the program. So what I'm trying to do is um, to come up with this structure of the RDFS, uh, RDF graphs. And in doing so, this is a continuation of my um, previous uh, research that I did. So earlier I came up with the approach to identify different entities in the RDF datasets. Uh, by entities, what I meant is when we have uh, different instances which share similar characteristics. For an example, if it has same type, that means the class, and because the people are not using properly types when they are defining the RDF graph, which is the case in real, people just use different URI patterns, even though they did not specifically say, okay, this is belonging to this class, they are using the unique URI patterns for different set of entities. So we are using that kind of features as well. So type URI pattern and the incoming and outgoing properties, and also whether it's object property or whether it's a data type property and the factors like that. So I already had an, when I started this project, I already had an algorithm to decide these entity sets. So what I did was I get the algorithm and I adapt it to uh, build the structure. That means I tried to modify the algorithm in a way that I can build hierarchical relationship, which is the subclass, uh, subclass and superclass and kind of thing. And also then adapt the algorithm to identify the relationship between the between different set of entities that I identify. So I'm done with that part, that means the basic uh, implementation and then I came up with a design notation like UML that people can, um, for an example, if a novel user who is first time using that data set for querying, they might they might feel difficult if we only, only give the RDF representation of the data. That means that person needs to have a good understanding about the RDF and then go and look at our RDF representation before querying. So then we design a UML-like notation that we can uh, define, okay, these are the classes that we identify and this is, the, this is how they are related to each other. So we designed that uh, design notation as well to uh, 
visually represent the structure that uh, we generated. So what we need to do is the evaluation and we find uh, we run into some problems uh, in running the evaluation as, I, as we expected earlier. So earlier we were trying to get the data set and distribute the data set into multiple clusters and then uh, run previous uh, federated querying application on top of those uh, uh, data sets and then compare the performances. But uh, that original plan won't work because the time uh, restriction that we had. So then we moved to the other plan that means uh, we'll, because uh, one of the application area that our, uh, the, the structure will be important is to uh, like come up with the queries. So what uh, within the time frame that we have, what we can do is we'll try to get some queries and then ask users to write the Sparkle queries by just looking at our diagram that we produce and then we also give the, uh, if, our if our structure will not be there, then we, are, we have something called, something called void description. So that's the only thing that we have if we don't have the schema or vocabulary. So then we give that to user and then uh, ask user to compare uh, which, which is the better one. And then also I still need to do come up with the RDF representation uh, for the structure that I generate. So those are the things that I did and these are the things that I have to do. Uh, do you have a, a, a you know, side by side comparison saying uh, if you, you know, the, here is our regular um, case and here is what I'm doing and so this is what the difference is. Without, record, without recording structure, here is what I have also. Yeah, so that is what I'm trying to use in the evaluation. So uh, what we have is if we don't have in the structure. In the document, we should have an example clearly oh, okay. showing uh, oh, this okay. is what makes a difference. Okay, okay. So uh, it's my Decision data set. It is about diseases and genes. How oh, disease. Disease. Di the, it calls disease some data data. Oh, disease some. Yeah. yeah. Disease yeah. So what they have given is these set of uh, these are the two classes that the uh, data set has, and these are the properties that the data set has. So this is the only information that uh, a user would have. Hmm. But there are multiple set of entities in the in the data set, which is not uh, come under a typed a typed class, but have a unique URI pattern. So we came up with uh, for now we have like seven uh, seven queries, and we will ask from probably we'll use one RDF expert who is much uh, knowledge about has a like a broader knowledge about RDF, and also a quite novel user that who would maybe at the initial stage of a Sparkle learning and kind of thing, and then ask them to compare the both approaches. Okay, next. Uh, you are um, your TA. Yeah. Do you graduate soon? Uh, no, uh, or like another year okay. for typically a master's. <laughs> All right. So uh, 
just to start my uh, project, um, title is the Detecting Seeker Suppliers for Coordination Using Uh Kind of looks abstract by the title, so uh, to simplify it, it's um, I'm, what I'm doing is analyzing the social media, the Twitter, uh, in the event of disaster, so that kind of tool which will help the coordinator who is coordinating the activities during disaster. So uh, the task what I'm performing in this uh, particular project is given the set of tweets, I am classifying these tweets into two categories, the tweets which are asking for some help and tweets which have the information about uh, providing particular help. On top of it, I'm identifying what specific resource is being asked in that tweet and what specific resource is uh, to be provided from the list which is uh, listed for the provider, uh, uh, as a provider tweets. So, uh, and the next task what I will be performing after this is I will detect the location which is mentioned in the tweets so that I can group the need of particular resources by the locations and group the particular resource providers uh, by the locations so that the person who is working as coordinator during this kind of event as a good idea about what is going on on where. So the semantic part is when I'm detecting the resources. So I have used an uh, ontology created for detecting a specific resource in the text. And I'm also using uh, an ontology for annotating the tweet for a particular location. So to detect a location and annotating it against a geo uh, ontology so that a person that is a coordinator can see that at state level, at a city level, what kind of needs are arising and what kind of resources are being currently provided. And I'm planning to evaluate it. Uh, it will be a manual evaluation for some to some neutral evaluator uh, so he or she will uh, evaluate this tweets or the two sets what I have created and the locations what I have created uh, as a result and so um, currently I am left with uh, evaluation and generating the actionable info which is generating the groups as I mentioned group of tweets according to resources and everybody to do is to uh, start their um, title of your page to be web 3.0 dash title of your um, project uh, and uh, in your uh, you know description somewhere I want to know what is the relevance of your project to this uh, course what is it that you did in the course whether it's through technology or even conceptually uh, is there any semantics here is there any other technologies that we discuss here that you're doing that or you're not? Because I think that is one, uh, if not the very significant, but at least a minor part of your grading. I, I do want it to be you know, relevant, not just some arbitrary project that you've done, um, you know, that it is part within the scope of what we cover. You are welcome to take some liberty on interpreting that, but I do you want to see what liberty you are, I may agree or not agree, if you take too much liberty. Um, and then uh, uh, make your, um, page um, uh, readable by link, right, shareable by link, and send that, the, uh, that link uh, to Sarasi. We already have a Google Doc mm -hmm. prepared okay. that for you. For all of the, all the, all of these, yeah. okay, good. I think, um, um, I think we don't have Adam's one, because you were out of the town during that day for a conference. But I thought I sent a sharing, 
you, you, we have the soft copy. We are talking about uh, oh, project. project. Yeah. Okay. Right. Just once you go Google Docs, you just send it. I'm looking at projects. Hmm. Good. Um, and uh, uh, I just want to, okay, any, anybody else left? So we're working on this cyberbullying. So we're um, analysis. So, so yeah, just de delete now proposal for kind of stuff and all that kind of thing. It's uh, done with the proposal now. In the future, yeah. So okay, go ahead. Um, so we've done. Um, we worked with Winbo, Winbo and Lou a bit. Um, so we got their code. So the first hurdle we had was just collecting tweets and then identifying which ones are uh, instances of bullying. So. First, we were just um, gathering any tweet that has a cuss word in it as a likely candidate and sorting through those. And then um, we sort of, you know, that was just too much data. It was hard to parse through. So we eventually narrowed it down to some key phrases and stuff. So we've got a pretty good sample set now. We've got um, 25,000 tweets and we've got a, uh, a sample set of Instead of looking for just anything with a cuss word in it, we're looking for you know something that's an actual threat to that's not a retweet that's directed at one other Twitter user as a candidate bullying tweet. And then um, the goal is to come up with a web app where we can go through these candidate tweets, load the conversation, and then see um, you know if this is an actual bullying instance where there's one user you know directing negative threats. Those are just the tools. What specific algorithms we use is different, right? Yeah, we're just going to look for a classifier. So we're getting a bunch of threatening tweets hmm. and then training the classifier. And then once we get it trained, just start running it on real time data. Have you discussed with Denbo which classifier, you know, which kind of classifiers are you going to do? Um, no, uh, a little bit. Talked about the uh, the naive phase um, classifier, and then there was another one. I'm trying to remember that was specifically good at dealing with <laughs> like text classification. So, um, so so the point here is that, uh, and I don't know with whom I was talking the other day. Uh, it, you need to have some intuition as to why that why why do you choose that particular type of classifier, right? Because everybody is all these classification. Something looks at uh, occurrences of words, word patterns. Something that, you know, something will compute even uh, much more uh, uh, you know detailed information about the order in which words appear. Other one does not care. Something would just be more about strings. So there would be you know. So so there are a whole variety of things that are there. Whole variety of statistics about the text that you would use. Um, so. I think you need to, you know, get a sense as to why, for the problem you have, you uh, you've chosen the right classifier. Okay. Hmm? Right. So, so that's where we're at. Um, any questions? Um, just to be able to, like, from from a, a you know a Twitter conversation to be sick. I guess the end why it's useful to society at large would be, you know, we can look at Twitter stream 
like when we started off, our grand idea was to build a dashboard that like a principal at a school could use to see, but you know, like that would be like a long term like end goal of this. But right now we're just trying to see like from just the raw Twitter data, can we train a computer to pick out, hey, you know, this is a, an instance of bullying. So like one more specific, you mean just one like, and I think that text when there is a bullying. It's a matter of making a civil society and people want to have a filter, let's say for children as an example. So that, that can be an example. We recently submitted a proposal that uh, tries to understand uh, 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 harassment on social media. So this is a related problem. You guys are on uh, schedule, you think? Yeah, um, yeah. I think uh, we scaled back the scope yeah, it appears. I think, yeah. but I think you know what what we'll end up with will be useful and window and lose um, research and hopefully push it forward. Did anything change after the discussion uh, yesterday about semantics? Yeah, yeah. So we'll definitely we're going to look at um, at the um, dynamics of the conversation mm -hmm. to make sure that you know the tweets like it's not just two people like talking foul mouth back mm -hmm. to each. Like it's different if a friend says I'm going to kill you versus you know somebody constantly telling one other user that hey I'm going to kill you when you get to school today or whatever. Okay. Uh, so, okay. so my name is Pramod. I didn't get the chance to explain explain about my project. So let me give you a brief introduction of what I'm doing and all. As the title says, it is mapping UMLS to ICD-10 codes. Let me give you uh, an introduction of the terminology that is being used here, the UMLS and the ICD-10 codes. Basically, UMLS uh, abbreviated as Unified Medical Language System, uh, Medical Language System provides a set of files and softwares uh, which bring together health and uh, biomedical vocabularies and standard standards, which uh, and to enable interoperability between different computer systems. So the point of interest uh, for my project in this is the UMLS provides a set of uh, standard codes for all the medical concepts. So, and coming to ICD-10, ICD-10 provides the classification of various diseases. Uh, it, 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 it provides codes for various diseases like uh, symptoms and it, it, be, it provides very nuanced classification like various symptoms, uh, complaints, all those comes in, etc. Uh, to, give you a, to give you guys a small example, it, there are codes for like left lung disease and right lung disease. It, it provides such nuanced codes. So how do we map between UMLS to ICD-10? Uh, let me tell you why, why do we need to map between UMLS to ICD-10? And where where will be where will we use UMLS? So to give you guys a clear picture, in any in any healthcare system, they every patient has this electronic medical records. So it is necessary that uh, for any healthcare to uh, healthcare for any healthcare company to give this uh, this EMR documents in, in the form of uh, small ICD-10 codes. Because most of the insurance companies or any or the government agencies, they look for ICD-10 codes. Uh, uh, for example, insurance com companies for the reimbursement of the uh, whatever disease that is uh, is diagnosed, that the uh, hospital is taking care of, they get, they reimburse based on this ICD-10 code. So it is mandatory for all healthcare systems to to give uh, uh, to give the insurance companies this ICD-10 codes. So there are systems which, which, which can uh, take this uh, EMR doc, uh, take the EMR document and annotate that EMR document against the UMLS codes. But there aren't any systems which annotate the uh, the di EMRs into direct ICD-10 codes. So uh, what I am dealing with is that 
Uh, since we have we already have systems which, which can annotate against UMLS codes, how can we map a bunch of UMLS codes into ICD-10 codes? Yeah, so the when we first thought about this uh, project, the first approach of ours is using an ontology here. Like uh, for every ICD-10 code, we can use an equivalent class uh, saying that patients suffering with these three uh, UMLS UMLS codes belongs to this ICD-10 code. But there we found out a problem uh, which is called open world assumption. Uh, I don't want to explain that uh, part of the pro problem which is way beyond the scope of this project. There are, s in, in some of the some of the codes, they say that a, a, per I mean, a disease without a particular condition, without a particular condition which is an UMLS code without a particular condition, it has a different ICD-10 code compared to a disease with that condition. So this this thing of without is not, uh, it is a very tough problem in representing uh, using ontologies. So we thought uh, we cannot do that using ontologies and we found out, we found out a different way of de uh, dealing that. So. Yeah, this is the problem actually. So there is a disease uh, yeah, for which uh, th there is a code which says that the disease, uh, uh, the patient is suffering with a particular disease and without an another condition. So that without part, we are not able to model that in an ontology. So that is the reason we didn't uh, go to that. Instead of that, what we what we thought of is that. Uh, Every in, uh, the all the ICD codes are in uh, are represent or modeled in a particular hierarchy. So just for hi for that hierarchy, use an ontology, and in that in the uh, for every ICD-10 code, uh, give it, give an annotation uh, in the in, in the annotations part of the ontology. Uh, write a Sparkle query saying that okay, uh, if a, a patient suffering with this disease and uh, some other conditions and all uh, 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 conforms to this particular ICD-10 code. So every 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 let's say uh, they, we have an ICD-10 code EO8.0. In this ICD-10 code, EO8.0 ICD-10 code refers to it, uh, diabetes mellitus due to uh, some condition and with hypersmolarity. So th this hypersmolarity has one UMLS code, and this diabetes mellitus has one UMLS code. So we write a Sparkle query uh, uh, and store that Sparkle query in the annotations part of the code. So uh, I don't want to go into technical details on the, of that. Uh, just to say, just to uh, give you a vague understanding of what that is, we will we will issue that Sparkle query on the. Uh, RDF dataset and see whether the pattern exists in that uh, dataset or not. Based on that, we'll say that this conforms to this, this patient conforms this to this particular ICD-10 code, and that is uh, that is the whole thing about the project. And coming to the part that where I am in, where I am in in the uh, in doing this project, we had initial discussions and all. We got the Perfect uh, architecture of how to go with the, uh, how to go with this, and now I'm in a pro uh, I'm coding for the developing. I'm in the developing stage of the project, and we are thinking of uh, in the next two weeks we are thinking of a final prototype kind of thing, and the evaluation for this will be basically a manual evaluation. We'll give a domain expert. Uh, We'll ask a domain e expert to give the system a, a set of diseases and see whether the whether the system is retaining the correct ICD-10 codes or not. And coming to the technologies that we are, that we are using in this project regarding the semantic web and all, uh, we'll be using a little bit of ontology and a Sparkle, query, a Sparkle, which is a very expressive language to query the RDF triples and all. Uh, that is all I got. Thank you.
project in very, you know, um, we got to see how well the how well the code is, right? Mm -hmm. That would be evolution and getting a sense of exactly what is correct answer, what is not, and why not do some new transmission. Yes, are you working on this at all? Or? Yeah, but that is a different approach. Mm -hmm. Here, what he is doing is he is querying the patient's information, and I am doing it in reverse way. I am generating query from patient's information and querying the codes. So it, it might actually make uh, for a very good, um, you know, outcome if both of you are able to compare them. Yeah. You might be able to write a paper, and, and both of them are actually is far better than say his own way. And I got that. So, right, any uh, questions? Uh, Hassan, anything that you need to know? Everybody knows where we are in the course and how we are going. Any, any question you want to ask, how grading works, how uh, I do, uh, basically I think we, um, I can certainly throw more information at you, more, more, you know, give you more lectures, but I think my main objective now is for you to learn uh, by doing your project and applying what we have learned as much as possible. Although some projects are a lot more into, you know, related to what we did, others are less, but I do want you to think. Um, and um, also, you need to all target to get everything done before the exam week. Um, I, I would like that we start uh, doing um, in terms of your deliverables, you have your project report, which should be a, you know, something fairly good, decent, readable, uh, easy to follow, has it should have example, should have clarity on what you did, uh, what the architecture, uh, data set, evaluation, outcome, you know, all the normal things that you will expect, uh, uh, you know, in a, uh, in, you know, some of you, who are into research may want to write it in a paper style. Others may want to write as a matter of fact kind of thing. Either is okay. If anybody has any question on how to write one way or the other, I'm available anytime or ask your colleagues also. Yeah, that is also fine. And um, uh, you'll be doing two things uh, to wrap up, three things to wrap up. One is, of course, your report itself. Number two is your final presentation which may simply be seen as an update of what you start, you know, your proposal. The third thing is demo. Uh, and um, if your demo did, does not work, then we have to, have, we can have a conversation of how much did you were able to do it, how well you did it, and, and such. If your demo worked, I want you to uh, show to the class, this is my work, this is how I meant to evaluate it, this is how I evaluated it, this is how I tested it. Uh, look, it works, uh, and it is on the web. And you can play with it. That would be an ideal uh, outcome. Do we need to put it on the web? Show? Yeah. yeah. You need to have, uh, I mean, unless, unless uh, it is a project of the kind that can't be done. You know, if you are creating a uh, resource and you just can't have a good GUI and uh, uh, can't put it on the web, then uh, it's, you know, those are not my ideal projects, but they are, they can be still adequate project for this class. But then still, Say, here was the objective, here is what I implemented, here is how I tested, it, here is how I know it works, here are the boundary conditions, it won't work in these situations, it's only been tested here, so on and so forth. Any uh, questions? So we will meet in the class, but I would like to, you know, people to use the next class to have a conversation. Most importantly, next Wednesday, 10th, right? I hope you guys have seen, uh, we have a we have a presentation at noon in uh, Joshi uh, Atrium here uh, by Chris Verity, who is one of the uh, co-developers of IBM Watson, one of the most significant technologies to come out that does include a uh, certain level of semantics, and it has a lot more technologies. It has a lot of NLP, it has voice recognition, it has many other things. And um, uh, uh, then at three o'clock in this room, we will be talking about use of, there will be more of an interactive session, 
use of Watson in medicine. You're not required to come uh, as a class member, but you're welcome to come as a you know, class member to really get a sense. But this is uh, your, um, uh, Chris Verity is coming here as a uh, distinguished speaker. Um, and um, uh, if you are going to work in any of this kind of area, or even if not, I mean, who, who would not want to know how a machine beat Jeopardy experts, right? So it, it, it uh, really um, conclusively beat out the past winners of Jeopardy, which is quite a significant achievement. So one of the great achievement of AI um, to some extent, and um, uh, it has some level of semantic technology. You can ask him on what it is and what is not. Your, you know, on your own. Uh, those of you who are in that area and want to read more, there is a special issue on that uh, in IBM Systems Journal uh, uh, on you know six or eight papers, all on Watson. And uh, I think I have shared around a bunch of links, right, on, on in the class. So even that. Earlier, I, you know, there's one video on how um, uh, doctors are communi asking Watson about what do you think uh, are the best uh, plans for this cancer patient. These are the kind of things. And the, the interesting thing that is happening now is that um, uh, such end users as doctors are able to just converse with the machine, just like you converse with another human being. You are able to talk to the machine. Now, we did not, you know, we. Uh, my expertise does not extend to voice recognition and uh, uh, natural language understanding as much, uh, you know, but uh, it's a hugely valuable thing. Uh, that is what is coming out, what has come out in Apple Siri, Google Now, all these things have, the interesting thing is that um, many of the systems uh, utilize, uh, not all, but a growing number of systems utilize ontology. It may not be ontology in our though, but in form of domain knowledge, specialized knowledge. I was just talking to a, a former student of mine today. Um, he uh, 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 worked for a major consulting company, it rose to senior, you know, uh, you know, senior position, and then um, I think he's possibly going to start up. And um, he said that he's meeting so many companies, startups in Silicon Valley where they all are talking about building ontology. And then he was commenting, see look, most of these guys don't know how to build ontology. They just know now that ontology is a cool thing to have or is a useful thing to have. So there's these kind of skills, ontology or semantics or domain specific uh, uh, vocabularies, number of these things, UMLS is an example of that, you know. Uh, the, these are becoming a very uh, valuable in huge demand. Those of you who want to go into that, you will have, I think, hopefully good uh, uh, you know, opportunities in the near term. And uh, demand outs outstrips supply right now of the talent in this area. And interestingly, they cannot recruit this kind of talents. Uh, they can't outsource this work. It's just not enough people in China and India and other places to with this kind of knowledge. So, so I think this is a very, um, Area, what we do in this class, or what uh, Chris uh, Benti will talk about, these are very good things. So come and know. And I think that that talk at least will be very, very uh, interesting for all of you. Okay. So in some sense, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll have a minimal class on Tuesday, but uh, uh, Wednesday, uh, come and enjoy more of.